Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door. Draw up a tombstone and sit down. Don't mind the fact that we've carved your name on it. <laughs> yeah, it's rather lonesome around here tonight, isn't it? Yes, most of the folks who haunt the place are out tonight with their sleds. If it snowed near your house, you may find them ghosting down here. But, Mr. Host, <laughs> ghosts don't go sledding, do they? Why, of course, Mary. Especially the ghosts of gangsters. They're used to being taken for a sleigh ride. Well, now, why don't you take your sled and join your friends and let me have a word with our Lipton listeners? Folks, have you ever noticed how often we all use the words good, better, and best? We're always comparing things, because comparisons help us decide what the best things in life are. For example, the perfect way to prove how really flavorful Lipton tea is is to compare Lipton's to any other tea and taste the difference. Lipton's flavor is brisk, never flat or wishy-washy. It gives you all the flavor, tastes just the way you like tea best. No other tea gives you more bright, mellow goodness because that superb flavor of Lipton's is extra rich, extra satisfying. Yes, friends, just compare Lipton's to any other tea. You'll find Lipton's gives you brisk flavor, and you'll find Lipton's wonderful brisk flavor gives you more contentment in every cup. All right, Mary. Now you go and perch yourself on that teapot over there and get ready to hear about The Dark Chamber. It's an original radio play by Robert Newman, who witnessed the story while peeking through a keyhole. Yes, and our star tonight is Kenneth Lynch, who plays the role of Joe. Our story tonight is about death. Violent death. And also about something which is even more terrifying. The unknown. You don't believe that anything can be more frightening than death. Then you've never experienced the ultimate in fear. But you will within the next few minutes. If you'll put out the lights, pull your chair up close and listen to the dark chamber. Police headquarters. Ryan speaking. Hello, police. Listen, you've got to help me. You've got to. I don't know how you can, but... My name is Watson, Joe Watson. I'm a driver for the Acme Sanitary Hand Laundry. Address? Where I am, I... I don't know. That's part of the trouble. Now, look. Hey, wait, listen. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. Check the laundry. Check the veterans. I'm an ex-GI. They'll tell you I'm straight. It... Well, I'm in a room someplace. I don't know where it is or how I got here or what I'm here for. I don't even know how long I've been here. It's a big room, but it's funny. No doors, no windows that I can see. It's just a couple of chairs and a table with this phone on it. I'm scared. What do you expect us to do? Find me. Find out what this is all about and get me out of here. I, I don't know. Oh, I... Listen, this isn't a gag. Can't you tell? You don't know what it's like just sitting here waiting, not knowing where or why or what's going to happen. Can't you trace this call or something? Well, okay. Hang on. Oh, thank heaven. I was afraid... You... Listen, I hear something. Someone's coming. I better hang up. I'll, I'll call you back later if I can. How do you do? Who are you? My name's Helming. Dr. John Helming. And your name? I don't have to tell you anything. That's very true. Although I didn't think you were aware of it. I think I already know everything about you that I'm interested in knowing. Like what? Name? Joseph Watson, age 26, occupation, employee of the Acme Laundry, honorably discharged from the army six months ago with the Brown Star and the Purple Heart. What the... So you cased me. Went through my pockets, huh? Well, if you know that much, you know I haven't got any dough. Money? I'm not interested in money. Well, what do you want, then? Where is this place? The last thing I remember is making a delivery on Spruce Street, noticing that the lights were out in the hall and hearing a noise behind me. You or somebody slugged me. That's right. Well, will you stop grinning like that and tell me what this is all about? Of course. I brought you here because I need your help in an experiment. 
An experiment whose details I've already worked out with mice and rabbits and cats and other animals. What kind of an experiment? An experiment in fear. Fear? Yes. You fought in the war. You were wounded. That means you've probably known fear. And still, you won the Brown Star, which means you overcame it. Now, the question is, can you overcome your present fears? What are you talking about? You're afraid. Nothing has happened to you yet, absolutely nothing, and yet you are afraid, aren't you? You're afraid because you're face to face with the unknown. Because you don't know what I want and what I'm planning to do. Um, which is as it should be. And uh, that's the way we'll leave it. For the moment. Hey, wait a minute. Come back here. Come back. You can't... Hello, police. This is Joe Watson again. Listen, I got a little more dope. I don't know if it'll help, but there was a guy in here just now. Said his name was Helming, John Helming. That's probably a phony. He's about 50, tall, over six foot, white hair and gray eyes. No, I still don't know what it's all about or what he's after, but have you been able to trace this number yet? Well, how long will it take? Okay, I'll hang on, but... What? The lights just went out. The room's pitch dark and somebody's coming in again. I better stop. But for Pete's sake, hurry! Who's that? Who just came in? Who are you? A girl. Keep away from me. Keep away, do you hear? Keep away? What's the angle now? Angle? Why did you bring me here? Wait a minute. You mean he put the snatch on you, too? When I was on my way home, chloroform or something. And the next thing I knew... Why are you pretending? You're in on it, too. You must be. It's a trap. It's a trap, all right. But I'm not in on it. I'm in it, along with you. My name is Watson. Joe Watson. I'm Betty Grant. You swear? I swear. What would I lie about it for? I wonder why he put you in here. Put us together. Who is he? What's he going to do? I don't know. He said something about an experiment. An experiment in fear, but... Hey, listen, we've got to get out of here somehow, Shh. some way. He might be listening. Very astute, my dear. Of course I'm listening. What the... Where are you? Right here in the dark. I've been here all the time. Why, are you... No, Joe, don't. He must want you to go for him. He's probably got a gun. Right again, my dear. Not that I'll need it. This is stage two of the experiment. A new stimulus to action has been introduced. Man against the unknown has become man and woman against the unknown. Look, let's get down to brass tacks. Be sensible about this. Thank you, Joe. That's why I won't need my gun. This new uh, stimulus has been negated by an increased sense of responsibility. Responsibility towards the girl, and therefore, by uh, increased fear. Bless you, gun or no gun, if I get my hands on you, where are you? Where are you? Outside now, so you can relax. That was the final stimulus in this stage. Angel pride. The discovery that I could read your innermost thoughts and knew exactly what you were going to do. But you mustn't let that bother you. I already know everything you're going to do from now on. Till the end. Listen, you! Helming! Helming! He's gone. Joe. I know. Hold on, baby. Don't let it get you. There must be a way, some way. I suppose he... He's still listening? It's hard to say. But I'm going to take a chance. There's one thing he didn't figure on. A telephone. Here? Yes. If I can find it again in the dark. It was over on the... Here it is. I put through two calls already to the police. Told them what was happening and asked them to get me out of here. I had to hang up both times before they could trace the call and get this number. But this time... Hello. Hello, operator. What? No, this isn't the operator. You're on a busy wire. It doesn't matter. Thank heaven I got somebody. 
I've been trying for about ten minutes now. Look, get off the line, will you? I've got to get through to the police. It's terribly important. But you've got to help me. You've got to. My name's Ben Lazari, and I'm a prisoner someplace. I don't know where. You what? I don't... It's true. A strange house somewhere. A doctor who says his name is Helmy. What? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Joe, what is it? What is it? I haven't got headquarters. I've got a guy that... I'm sorry, Ben. It's no use. What do you mean? We're in the same boat you are. A girl named Betty Grant and myself. Helming's got us locked up, too. You, too? Yeah. He said he knew everything we were thinking, everything we were going to do. I did get through to the police before, but I guess he caught wise. We're talking to each other over an inside line. Then? Yeah. We're through. No. Joe, don't say that. Don't even think it. Look, ask him exactly where he is. Just where are you, Ben? Do you know? It's hard to say. I was out cold when he brought me here. It's a kind of a hall, a passageway. Cement floor, ceiling, stone walls. There doesn't seem to be any door or opening or anything like that. That's what I thought here, too. But there must be one, or how would he have gotten you in there? Hey, listen, start looking. See if you can find it. That's true. I never thought of that. If I do find the door and it opens into where you are... That's right. Three of us together. We'll surely be able to figure something out then. Hold on. I'll start pounding on the walls. You see if you hear anything. Go ahead. What's he doing? He's going to knock on the walls to see if he's anywhere near us. And if he is, if he can find a door, we can get together. Hear anything? I'm not sure. Maybe. I'm not sure either. Sounds awful far away, is it? There, listen. That wall right there. Hello. Hello, Ben. Yes? We heard you. You're right next to us. Now, Ben, you listen and Betty will knock back. Go ahead, Betty. That way, Ben, you'll be able to tell just which wall it is. Okay. Right. I hear it. I know where it is. Now to find the door, if there is one. Hold on. He's got it. He's going to see if there's a door. There must be one. There must be. Ben. And... Ben. Ben. Hello. What is it? I don't know. I thought I heard a moan. Joe. Look. There is a door. It's opening. It's open. Dr. Helming. Why, yes. Were you expecting someone? that you mention it, Doctor, there was someone we've been expecting and waiting for since we first heard about that cozy little place of yours. I think he's finally arrived. He's a tall, rather striking gentleman with a skull for a face, and his name is Death. Mr. Host, that Dr. Helming is insane. <sighs> he gives me the chills. Oh, maybe it's just because it's so cold tonight, Mary. You know, it's getting so nippy these days that some of my friends are having fur collars put on their shrouds. <laughs> well, my <laughs> friends are smarter. They know that the way to warm up in cold weather is with a hot cup of fragrant, delicious Lipton tea. A cup of tea in front of the fireplace just hits the sot these chilly days. But make it Lipton's and your pleasure's complete. You brew up a pot of Lipton's, throw another log on the fire, and summer tiptoes right into the room. Let the wind blow and the snow pile up on the roof. There's all the magic of June in a cup of Lipton's, in its deep amber color, its tantalizing fragrance, and its rich, hearty flavor. Mmm, and what flavor that is. Never wishy-washy, always brisk and full and satisfying. Try it, folks. You can let winter do its worst when you've got Lipton's in your cup. That's right, Mary. But I think it's time now for something a little more cold-blooded, such as a cold-blooded murder. We're having a juicy one here tonight, a tale of gore galore, so let's see what's happening in the dark chamber. It's just a moment later now. Standing in the darkness of the strange room, Joe and Betty stare at the tall figure of Dr. Helming, silhouetted against the dim light from outside. I asked you whether you were expecting someone. Then it was just a trick. It was you on the phone all the time. Now, don't you think I'd know his voice? Where, 
Where is he? Our friend, Mr. Lazari, right outside. What did you do to him? Answer me. What did you do to him? Don't you know? Sure, I know. You killed him. You... Did you kill him? Quite a state you've gotten yourself into. Why? Is it because you finally tried to do something about your predicament and failed? Or is it because you weren't sure whether I would kill or not, and because you still don't know? You're mad. Really mad. You'll be interested to know. You have not done, nor will you do, one thing that I did not foresee. Every move you made, every emotion you felt, was charted, outlined, and... What's that? That, I think, is probably the police. The police? Yes. I know that you're very anxious to talk to them, and I'll see that you get a chance to. Soon. Good evening, officer. I'm looking for a guy named Helming. Uh, Dr. Helming. I'm Dr. Helming. Come in, won't you? Okay. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, kind of a funny business. It's about a phone call we got a while ago. Finally traced here. The guy who said he was a prisoner or something. That must have been Watson. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. Joe Watson. Do you know him? Of course. I can't tell you how sorry I am. It was really very careless of me, and I'll see that it doesn't happen again. What do you mean? If you did any investigating, which I'm sure you did, then you know that I, um, well, I don't run a sanitarium exactly, but I do take a few patients, mental cases, for treatment. Ah, so that's it. A nurse, eh? I, I wish you wouldn't say that. Watson's case is particularly interesting. A 4F who wasn't able to enlist, and he developed a persecution mania. Thinks that everyone is down on him. Not everyone, exactly. His present fantasy is that he's an ex-GI and that I'm keeping him prisoner. Sure sounds plenty tough. Well, I guess I'll run along. I... I'm sorry I bothered you. Don't you want to see them first, officer? Talk to them? Ah, there's no need of that, doctor. We we get calls from cranks every day. We, We always investigate the cause. But I insist... After all, you only have my word for it. Uh, there's, um... Well, there's just one thing I'd like to caution you about. Sure, sure, I know. I'll play along. Humor them. Splendid. Right in here. Hmm. It's quite a room. Joe! Look! It, it's a cop, and that means... Then you did get my message. Uh, sure, sure, Joe. Took a little time to trace a call, but uh, everything's okay. Oh, thank heaven. It was such a screwy story, I was afraid that... Hey, wait a minute. Then why is he standing there like that? Why haven't you got the bracelets on him? Dr. Helming? No need for any rough stuff. He said he'd come along quietly. What? You're but... lying. I don't know why, but there's something wrong here. Something... I know. You think we made the whole thing up. That we're crazy. I know, no, no. It's true. He told you we were, and you believed him. Of course not. Look, I... I Stop it, will you? Stop saying that. Well, if I could only prove it somehow, I'll show you. I know. Lazari. Joe. Murder. That'll open your eyes. Somewhere in that wall is a door. Make him open it. Show you what's behind it. I think maybe I'd better be going, Doc. But there is a door there, officer. Just a second. I'll open it for you. Here we are. Body. It's gone. <laughs> These doctors are always hiding the bodies. Returns up again later. Give us another ring, huh? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Hey, can I go out this way down? Down to the end of the corridor, then to your right. I, I'm sorry I gave you all this trouble. Perfectly all right. Thank you for being so understanding. Quite all right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doc. Well, children... Don't look that way, Joe. Don't. I know what you're thinking, and it's not true. We're not crazy. There was a body there. Of course. You hid it when you went out to let the cop in. And the telephone. You left that here purposely. Wanted me to use it. Get the police here. Obviously. I told you that this was to be an experiment in fear. What I didn't tell you was that, in a sense, I was one of the subjects, too. It was important for me to learn how I would function under pressure. And speaking objectively, I think I did rather well. Don't you? Why are you doing all this? What are you after? There's no reason why I shouldn't tell you. 
If anyone truly understands the nature of fear, is able accurately to forecast the actions and reactions of an individual, then he can use fear as a weapon. Society will react as the individual reacts. You see, society doesn't want to believe that anything can menace it. Doesn't want to take action to protect itself any more than the individual does. This was something that Hitler and Mussolini understood intuitively. I understand it scientifically. They failed, but I shall succeed. You... You mean that you... I'm afraid that's all I have time for. As far as you two are concerned, the experiment is finished. Completely finished. I have a few arrangements to take care of, and then, uh... (laughs) Well, make the best of these last few minutes, uh, for they will be your last. Joe, do you hear anything? Is he coming back? Not yet. He's going to kill us, isn't he? Just the way he killed Lazari. He's going to try to. Why are you sitting there like that, looking at me? Hmm? I guess because it's the first chance I've had to look at you. How do you mean? When he first put you in here, it was all dark. So many things happened after that. It's funny. What is? The things that you can tell about a person, even in the dark. I kind of thought you were little, and... I knew you were awful nice and had a lot of nerve, but... I didn't think you'd be so pretty. I'm not so pretty, Joe. I'm not very brave, either. I'm scared. I'm awful scared. And I don't want to die. Don't worry about it, baby. Don't think about it. Sitting here like this, waiting. And there's nothing we can do. Every time we did try to do something, it was something he knew about. He was expecting us to do. Please, baby. Joe, something happened to you. You were scared before, too, but now... It was not knowing that was scary. Not knowing what was going to happen or why or what you could do about it. But once you do know, once you make up your mind, then you've got to forget about it. Forget about everything. Make up your mind about what? This is going to sound kind of funny, especially now, but... Well, do you have anyone special? A fellow, I mean, that... Why, oh, I know. That's good. I mean, well, gee, it's a shame we never met before. If we had, we wouldn't be here now. I, I mean, we probably would have been out together someplace. And what time do you get through work usually? About six. The store closes at five thirty. But me too. I could have picked you up at about six. Joe, and... I hear something. He's coming. Yeah. Okay, get up. Over in the corner of the room so that he'll see you as soon as he opens the door. What about you? I'll be waiting over here, behind the door. Joe, you, you, you're you not yeah. going to... I know I haven't got much of a chance, but... Well, wish me luck. And it'll be quick anyway. Oh, no, Joe, please. All right, my young friend. Time. All my arrangements have been completed, and I'm... Where's Watson? Right here. Joe, it! It's okay, baby. Didn't get me. I got the barrel of the gun. And... Good Lord. Got him. In the chest. Beth, you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have. Outside, Betty. See if you can find another phone. Call the police again. And this time, tell them to bring an ambulance. But you couldn't have done it. It was all plotted. Graphed and worked out in detail. I knew just what you were going to do, how you would react. 
By this time, you were to be in a state of complete frustration, resigned, ready to die. Why did you do it? Why? I don't know. Now, just take it but easy. I've got to know. You've got to tell me. Was it because of the girl? Out of d d desperation? Because you <laughs> knew you were going to die anyway? I tell you, I don't know. I just know that... Well, a guy will take just so much pushing around. <laughs> Pushing around, eh? Well, it sounds to me as if one of our characters is going to get a lot of pushing around. At the end of a pitchfork and in a very warm climate. Yes, good old Helming's finished. He's got to be if we're to have at least two corpses, the inner sanctum minimum. Oh, you think that's a little arbitrary? Not at all. We've got to have at least two corpses to play our theme song. When a body meets a body. <laughs> Theme song? I didn't know we had one. Oh, Mary, we've got lots of them. Didn't you ever hear our skeleton song? I ain't got no body. Hmm? Mr. Host, <laughs> let's be serious for a moment, because I want to talk about one of the most serious things in life, our health. For instance, the war may eventually lead to an increase in tuberculosis, and that's why the makers of Lipton tea and Lipton soup have asked me to remind you of the annual sale of Christmas seals. Funds raised by this sale support tuberculosis control programs, x-rays, health education, and medical research. Remember, over a half million people in the United States and Canada suffer from this disease. So buy as many Christmas seals as you can. No one is safe from tuberculosis until everyone is safe. And Christmas seals can save lives. <laughs> And now, friends, here's a word of wholesome advice. If you've had any murderous thoughts lately, give them up. It uh, just doesn't pay. Well, I know a lady who killed off her husband, and you know, it just ruined her marriage. Yes, he grew very cold to her. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Fearful Passage by H.C. Branson. Yes, in next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, next week's story is about a vampire. He's a very stingy fellow. As when you go out with him, the drinks are always on you. <laughs> Naturally, we're going to try to make him feel at home here, so uh, I've just ordered a good supply of bats with green eyes, a coffin for him to sleep in, and a wooden stake to drive through his heart. I wouldn't stake my life on it, friends, but he may visit you before next Tuesday. <laughs> Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? <laughs> Easy to make and easy to take. That's Lipton's Noodle Soup, the perfect opening dish for your cold-weather menus. Lipton's Noodle Soup has that real chickeny flavor your family likes so much, and it has that wonderful, fresh-cooked, homemade goodness. You can prepare Lipton's Noodle Soup in a jiffy, too, and it's oh so kind to your budget. Costs less and makes more than canned soups. So don't forget to serve Lipton's Noodle Soup. <laughs> And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.